three. His head bent down, he began to walk, following the crescent-shaped line of dunes that surrounded the village like a rampart and towered above it. He paid almost no attention to the distant landscape. An entomologist must concentrate his whole attention within a radius of about three yards around his feet. And it is one of the fundamental rules that he should not have a sun at his back. If the sun should get behind him, he would frighten the insects with his own shadow. As a result, a collector's forehead and nose are always sunburned. The man advanced slowly at a steady pace. With every step the sand splashed up over his shoes. Except for shallower rooted weeds that looked as though they would shoot up in a day if there were any moisture, there appeared to be no living thing. Once in a long while, tortoise shell colored flies would flit around, drawn by the odor of human perspiration. However, precisely because it was such a place, he could expect to find something. Beetles are not especially gregarious, and they say that, in extreme cases, a single beetle will cordon off an area of as much as one square mile. Patiently, he kept walking round and round. Suddenly he paused in his tracks. Something had stirred near the roots of a clump of grass. It was a spider. Spiders were of no use to him. He sat down to smoke a cigarette. The wind blew ceaselessly from the sea and, far below, Turbulent white waves beat against the base of the sand dunes. Where the dunes fell away to the west a slight hill crowned with bare rock jutted out into the sea. On it the sunshine lay scattered in needle points of light. He had difficulty getting his matches to light. Out of ten tries not one had caught. Along the length of the match sticks he had thrown away, ripples of sand were moving at about the speed of the second hand of his watch. He focused his attention on one wavelet, and when it arrived at the tip of his heel he arose. The sand spilled from the gathers in his trousers. He spat, and the inside of his mouth felt rough. So probably there weren't too many insects. Perhaps the movement of the sand was too violent. No, he shouldn't be so quickly discouraged. His theory guaranteed that there would be some. The line of dunes leveled off and a section jutted out on the side away from the sea. He was lured on by the feeling that in all probability his prey was there, and he made his way down the gentle slope. Here and there the remains of what seemed like a wind fence made of walling marked off the point of the promontory, beyond which, on a still lower level, lay a plateau. He went on, cutting across the ripples of sand, which were hewn with machine-like regularity. Suddenly his line of vision was cut off and he stood on the verge of a cliff looking down into a deep cavity. The cavity, over sixty feet wide, formed an irregular oval. The far slope seemed relatively gentle, while in contrast the near side gave the feeling of being almost perpendicular. It rolled up to his feet in a smooth curve, like a lip of heavy porcelain. Placing one foot gingerly on the edge, he peered in. The shadowy interior of the hole, set against the luminous edge, already announced the approach of evening. In the gloom at the bottom a small house lay submerged in silence. One end of its ridge pole was sunk diagonally into the sand wall. Quite like an oyster, he thought. No matter what they did, he mused, there was no escaping the law of the sand. Just as he was placing his camera in position, the sand at his feet began to move with a rustle. He drew his foot back, shuddering, but the flow of the sand did not stop for some time. What a delicate, dangerous balance. Breathing deeply, he wiped his sweaty palms several times on the sides of his trousers. A coughing broke out next to him. Unnoticed, an old man, apparently one of the village fishermen, was standing there almost touching his shoulder. As he looked at the camera and then at the bottom of the hole, the old fellow grinned, screwing up his face which was wrinkled like a haft and rabbit skin. A sticky secretion encrusted the corners of his reddened eyes. Are you inspecting? It was a thin voice, blown by the wind, rather as if it came from a portable radio. But the accent was clear and not particularly difficult to catch. Inspecting? Flustered, he concealed the lens with his palm. He shifted his insect net into full view. What do you mean? I don't understand. I'm collecting insects. My specialty is and insects. What? 
The old man did not seem to have understood. Collecting insects, he repeated again in a loud voice. Insects. Insects. I catch them like this. Insects. The old man appeared dubious. Looking down, he spat. Or perhaps it would be more exact to say he let the spit loose from his mouth. Snatched from his lips by the wind, it sailed out in a long thread. Good heavens, what was he so nervous about? Is there some inspecting going on in this vicinity? No, no, as long as you're not inspecting, I really don't mind what you do. No, I'm not inspecting. The old man, without even nodding, turned his back and, scuffing the tips of his straw sandals, went slowly away along the ridge. Some fifty yards further on when had they come? Three men dressed alike, apparently waiting for the old man, squatted silently on the sand. The one in the middle had a pair of binoculars, which he was turning around and around on his knee. Soon the three, joined by the old man, began to discuss something among themselves. They kicked the sand at their feet. It looked as if they were having a violent argument. Just as he was trying unconcernedly to go on with his search for the beetle, the old man came hurrying back again. Then you're really not someone from the government office. The government office. You're quite wrong. Abruptly he took out his business card, as if to indicate that he had had enough. The old man's lips moved laboriously. Ah, you're a school teacher. I have absolutely no connection with the government office. So you're a teacher. At last he appeared to understand, and the corners of his eyes wrinkled up. Carrying the card respectfully, he went back again. The three others, apparently satisfied, stood up and withdrew. But the old man returned once again. By the way, what do you intend doing now? Well, I am going to look for insects. But the last bus back has already gone. Isn't there any place I can stay here? Stay all night. In this village. The man's face twitched. If I can't stay here, I'll walk on to the next village. Walk. As a matter of fact, I'm in no special hurry. Well, why go to all that trouble? He suddenly became loquacious. You can see this is a poor village, he said in an accommodating tone. There isn't a decent house in it. But if it's all right with you I'll put in a good word and see what I can do to help you out. He did not seem to bear any ill will. They were just being cautious perhaps on the lookout for some prefectural official who was scheduled to come on a tour of inspection. With their sense of caution appeased, they were merely good, simple fisher folk. I should be very grateful if you would. Of course. I will expect to show my appreciation I am particularly fond of staying in village houses. 